I'm John Travis in Novato, California on the 1st of October, 2020, talking to Kristen Viken and John Kent in Glendale, Arizona, a suburb of Phoenix. And I'm uh, here today to find out more about your history. I've known you for probably eight or 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, know your work, but don't know the origins of it and how you've contributed to, to wellness in your ways. So uh, with couples, uh, we'll, we'll do one and then the other for a segment like your childhood, and then we'll switch back and forth, and then eventually we'll merge when, you're, uh, when you met. But uh, uh, women first, we'll start with you, Kristen, uh, where you were born and uh, what uh, siblings, early childhood experiences, what your parents did or how they influenced you and, and just your background if, uh, if we can begin. Yeah, so uh, uh, I was born in Bergen, uh, Norway. Uh, it's on the west coast of Norway. And uh, I was born to a mom that was a therapist and a dad that was working in finances. And uh, I was the firstborn in the family that was uh, the, the awaited child, so to speak. Yes. They really, really wanted to get pregnant. And uh, like a year and a little bit after um, my sister was born. And so it's just uh, me and my sister. We have two, two siblings. And um, yeah. Uh, how I was influenced by my mom and dad. Yeah, or any other influences, grandparents. Yeah, yeah, so my, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, my mom probably is a very strong influence because she, she started working, she was a therapist. And so she was both a mom and a therapist. And so my mom and dad divorced when I was about six and a half or so. And my mom just basically took us on. My dad was supportive in the background, you could say, but we lived with my mom. And so from six and a half until I moved out of the home, my mom was in some ways the most uh, immediate role model, if you will. And so she painted the walls and did everything. Like she was like a super mom. So she really influenced me and taught me both how to manage uh, nearly anything. At the same time, I have had to do a lot of work not to just do everything on my own. So, you know, she really was a, a very good uh, fuel for my growth and coming into greater balance in my feminine, I would say. Well, great, because we have a saying in the States of Preacher's Kid, my dad was one, uh, who are usually the opposite, and then there's a the psychologist kids. But it sounds <laughs> like you escaped that stereotype. <laughs> yeah. So then school, how was that for you? Well, school, I was very, I've always loved to learn. I've always uh, been uh, curious and uh, uh, I would say mentally desiring food for thought, if you will. So I was active in school, active in sports. Um, my dad died when I was in my, like, uh, he got sick very, very suddenly and died very, very suddenly. Uh, so I was in my 17, 18 in there. Uh, when my father crossed. And so I would say that, you know, everything was rolling like a normal teenager, if you will, up until then. So I was headed towards becoming a psychologist in the University of Bergen. Uh, my dad passed and he basically became the, the catalyst, if you will, to, to me starting some form of spiritual pursuit. Mm. So uh, he, his passing uh, literally shifted my entire life. So I ended up going to France to, to, with, with, with a couple of girlfriends who wanted to learn French in an exchange program. I, I just went with them because I was in some ways a bit lost after my dad's passing. 
And there I met a Frenchman who knew about the shaman in America. And uh, I fell in love with a Frenchman and wanted to go to America because he wanted to go to America, not because I really had an idea about wanting to study with a shaman, but then came to the States, met my teacher there, and basically nearly, like, I moved shortly thereafter. So my whole transition from uh, a more regular life to a spiritual life I would say my dad was the catalyst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when was it you came to the States? 1989. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, going back and forth between Norway and Los Angeles, uh, where uh, my teacher and his wife was located and the school were. And so, and then I was working on trying to find a way to get a green card so that I could stay. So I, I used a couple of years figuring out about that until I got a green card. Uh -huh. And then I've been here ever since. Uh -huh. And my devotion has really been uh, uh, to the sweet medicine sun dance tradition, to a uh, pursuit of a, of a spiritual life of my own healing and so on. Good. Well, let's pause there and switch to John, and then we'll pick up uh, when we get to, to a, a similar place. So, how about you, John? Well, I was uh, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my father is an account, well, was an accountant, he's retired now. And my mother was a microbiologist that worked for CDC. And um, yeah, I grew up in the suburbs, a place called Stone Mountain. Uh, loved to play soccer, was very athletic, and was somewhat of a troublesome kid in the elementary school. And then a friend of my dad suggested to, uh, that I go and see a child psychiatrist because I uh, was very smart, but I was doing very bad in school. In fact, I was a couple of years behind. I was in the third grade doing math, like first grader, and uh, my mom worked for hours with flashcards, but it just didn't seem to click. And uh, I, I looked for the child psychiatrist because she basically changed the course of my life. She met with me twice and saw that I needed structure and and that I was bored in, in uh, public elementary school and suggested a private school. So I um, had to take some special tests and then my parents shopped around and they found this uh, wonderful Catholic elementary school called St. Thomas More. Uh, it was in Decatur, another suburb of Atlanta. And while I was there, um, my first uh, teacher that was my homeroom teacher, my math teacher, she kind of recognized that uh, I was going to learn in a different way. So she asked me one day after class, do you know the answers before I say them? And I said, yes. She said, mm. well, would you like to study on your own? And I was like, okay. So she basically put me in a corner with books and I could just tear through them as uh, at my own pace. And she would come over while the class was doing an assignment and and answer my questions but I went through three years of math in one year and just kind of was this uh, awakening to learning uh, prior to that I think I was mostly into things physical I would play outside and I would you know enjoy fantasy books that my uh, dad would read to me but I hadn't really awoken to this mental hunger to learn and mm. so this Miss Wall was her name my fourth grade uh, math teacher. I, I even looked to try to find her too. They don't, unfortunately, the school didn't keep her records. Mm -hmm. I felt like I really owed her uh, indebtedness, like a soul connection that she saw something different, both mm -hmm. the child psychiatrist and, um, and this teacher. So I just kind of became hungry to learn and to know. And um, that took me through high school. And I loved chemistry. And even went to summer school because I wanted to take calculus my senior year. And I didn't have, because I'd started slow with the math and my elementary school didn't have advanced algebra. I kind of 
started with the group, but calculus was something extra. So I had to go to summer school taking advanced algebra um, to kind of qualify in our high school. So it's funny that I spent a whole summer willingly go to summer school with a bunch of people that were unwilling. <laughs> um, but I loved math and I loved chemistry. What's that? Any siblings? No, yeah, I'm the only child. Uh, and uh, I think my dad, from a spiritual point of view, was a big influence for me growing up. Mm -hmm. He was interested in the Rosicrucians. I had a certain spiritual awakening in the elementary school. I, I hadn't been baptized, but I was just totally fascinated by the spiritual nature of the church. So I became baptized and became confirmed and was an altar boy. And even in high school was thinking about being a priest because I was, you know, fascinating with what is uh, other than the physical, what is this force inside of us that, you know, longs to reach out to the greater and how, how the greater is touching us on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, so with that was a driving force inside, but I kind of put it on the shelf when I went to college because I went to Georgia Tech and got my degree in chemical engineering. And um, while I was going through school, I said I would never work in the paper industry because it smelled, but they gave me you know, the, the jobs I interviewed. They had the highest pay. So then I went to Florida into the paper industry to... Uh, to work and worked there for two years and became kind of disenfranchised. I had developed the whole uh, environmental program for the bleaching plant that the paper mill I was consulting with were all on board, but my company wasn't. And I uh, looked to go back to school. I'd done research while I was in uh, college with a professor, some advanced research, but he wasn't funded and was kind of in this floating space. I'd been in Florida for two and a half years, didn't really like the company I worked for anymore, didn't really so much like the industry, got a little disenfranchised and uh, with the corporate environment, even though I was in a paper mill, it was still kind of a, a uh, had a report to a vice president of our uh, paper chemicals division. So I was kind of hungry and seeking, so I uh, connected with my dad and uh, he was involved with the deer tribe and uh, studied with swift deer and said, well, why don't you kind of check this stuff out? How did he get connected with that? It sounds a pretty unusual dad. Yeah, well, he, uh, yeah, he was, because he was always, no matter what, even though he was an accountant, he was always into something spiritual. He, hmm. um, and I, it's a good question. I should ask him where it came from, because my grandfather was, uh, World War II war hero and a medical doctor, so it didn't come from him. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any siblings that of my dad's. He was also the only child, but he I, always and still to this day has this um, close connection with spirit, I would say, with God. And so he studied Rosicrucians, and that was around when I was a kid, and he would talk some stuff that was I didn't know at the time, but I later learned was Rosicrucian, and and then when I got interested in the Catholic Church, he got interested in some deeper studies that he and my mom did. Uh, my parents got divorced, and he met a woman who was into alternate therapy, homeopathy. Um, uh, and I think my dad also kind of just went wild with going to different workshops and exploring and finding what is out there in the world of spiritual teachings, alternate ways. And uh, he came across the Deer Tribe. And I think Kadoshka, the spiritual sexual workshops was the first uh, connection that he had and found. And, um, and interesting enough, he and uh, this woman he was dating, her name was Xenia at the time, uh, they sponsored uh, Kuroshka's while I was in college. I didn't even know about it, but Christine and Swift Deer and his wife and several other teachers in, uh, in the Deer tribe came to North Georgia to go to a workshop. And I was in Atlanta, so it was kind of like ships passing in the night. But at the time, I wasn't interested in the weird stuff my dad was doing. <laughs> but when I got kind of, you know, I, I was looking for something more to life than the 
the house with the two cars and the picket fence is kind of a prepackaged ideal life that I uh, had been striving for that I thought was like what it was to be a good person and to be a successful person. That was no longer what I was interested in. I didn't know what I was interested in. So it was kind of fortunate that, uh, you know, he had all kinds of uh, arcane books in his bookshelf from Tai Chi to uh, spirituality, to the Kabbalah, to, to yeah. Dianetics, you know, L. Ron Hubbard and like everything. If it had something to do with spirituality that had been published, and this is in the um, uh, late eighties and early nineties, he probably had it on his bookshelf. Conversations with God. I remember that was a big, yeah. Uh, Celestine prophecy. Those were like big books. Oh, yeah. I read them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I kind of took my dad's advice and I uh, went to a, a Kadoshka workshop. He had a, a group of people that he had a study group for the Deer Tribe and he had some of his uh, students that he was teaching as more of like a sharing circle where everyone would, would mm -hmm. kind of share their experience and their insights. We all piled into a big van and drove to North Carolina and uh, did a Kadoshka and I thought, wow, this is like, this is fantastic. This is a hell of a lot better than chemical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out with a hard hat and steel toe shoes and with stuff dripping that would, uh, you know, stain your clothes. Much better to go hang out uh, with Kodoshka. And so I was just interested and I decided that I would go and do the, the second level of the Kodoshka workshop, which was in Phoenix. And my dad's like, oh, you have to meet Swiftier and you... You, know, you have to do this and you have to do that. Uh, and so I, I was still living in Atlanta. I had moved back to Atlanta from Florida. And so I came out to Phoenix and that's how I met Christine was, uh, she was Swifter's assistant and she also was part of the staff for that second level Kodoshka that I came out to. And, uh, and I was hooked after that. I was like, I'm gonna move to Phoenix. <laughs> All right. And I realize I've been mispronouncing your name, Christine, because I, I went by the spelling. <laughs> I don't actually well, you know that often. The American way of pronouncing the <laughs> spelling is Kristen, but the, the Norwegian way is more like uh, something in between Christine and Kristen. It's more like uh, my mom would say, Christine. Oh, uh, okay. So, so I kind of go along with whichever... <laughs> spelling there whichever pronunciation and anybody says because you know that's how it is when you are a foreign foreigner in a country yeah. no one gets your name right ever <laughs> <laughs> so when, and it doesn't uh, matter so much to me actually well good um so did you actually meet up then uh, uh or you met at this workshop in in north carolina or no you came out to phoenix it's phoenix yeah yeah and uh um how how was your first meeting and what uh, tell us <laughs> all about that well Two we, different versions we we yeah. probably recognized each other at the workshop but you know how it is uh, at at workshops if you are on staff you have nothing to do with yeah. uh, with the participants at all so we recognized each other there uh, and uh, when we uh, when Afterwards, when John decided that he wanted to stay for a little bit longer, we met up and we had an incredible chemistry and a <laughs> capacity to talk and share and, and, and explore. And we had similar interests uh, of self-growth and, and, and so on. So we just really got ourselves uh, we started interacting and interacting and interacting and finding our, uh, how could you say, like harmonic resonance together, you could say, an attraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was, uh, I, don't, I don't think any one of us were looking for anybody. So it was one of those, one of those experiences when you, you meet someone and you, you discover as you're meeting them that this is something that I would like to discover more about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the nature of our relationship. I think because we are, because we both were, like I was already completely dedicated to my path at that point. 
So I've been in the path for what, seven this years or something? 96. Nine, yeah, think. so seven 96, years. 90. It was like we met in 96. And so I wasn't looking, to, I was looking to integrate my path into no matter what I would be doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the, because of that, and John was very interested in growing and learning and evolving and everything like that and on his own. So I think both of us were so interested in, in growth and in, in education, if you will, and healing and so on that that uh, the theme of how we met continues through whatever challenges because we've been together now for 24 20, years, four years. Mm -hmm. so what has what has uh, taken us through the birth canal of the uh, challenges that could possibly come in a relationship between a man and a woman has really been our desire to grow so we've been able to utilize our challenges as a fuel for our healing and our growth and i think that's that 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 was already present in the beginning of our meeting if you will mm. Yeah, but I was smitten with her the first time I saw her, though. I was like flirting <laughs> with her the whole workshop, giving her oranges and fruit and, you know, trying everything I can, like puffing up. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> now, was this in North Carolina, that workshop? Or now, this was in Phoenix. The Phoenix. one that was in North Carolina, uh, she wasn't at. Right. It was a different level teacher two. over there. Yeah. And um, so it was, I, I came to, to Phoenix in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, and didn't even know that she was going to be part of staff. I, I actually had met her in just a little kind of a, a chance meeting when I went to visit Swifter before the workshop, and I was like, "Wow, who's that?" But it was you know the focus was there to meet with Swifter, and then uh, when I went to the Kadoshka workshop, then the first evening it was a Thursday evening when it starts. She was there as part of staff, and I was like, "Wow, okay, great." Uh -huh. um, but you know, I, I was uh, not willing to keep the line between <laughs> staff and students. I was flirting, mainly, you know, just <laughs> flirting all the time. Very clear that I'm I'm interested in you. <laughs> but I I think what Christine says that that what's kept us together has been the um, because there's the knowing inside ourselves that no matter what happens in life, no matter where life takes us, that we will be focusing on a spiritual journey, a spiritual evolution. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, any challenges in relationships or, you know, we've been full-time business partners since like 2004, 2003, something like that. Mm -hmm. And even any of those challenges, it's working together as a, as a, couple and business partners have all got folded into um, our own individual journey of growth and evolution. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, you know, the key element that's helped us kind of overcome stuff to stay together, keep becoming intimate and searching for how do we become more intimate. And I think that, you know, both of us are incredibly stubborn. Yeah. And both of us are, 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 are willful. Do dog headed, so to say. Willful. <laughs> Holy moly. So we, we good, we are good match because we, we don't get to control each other. No. <laughs> Another opportunity for growth. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so now uh, you're in, in Phoenix in 96, you've met. Uh, so you decide to say, John, stay, John, and, and then what, what, how did yeah, you? Yeah, well, after the Kadoshka, um, the people that, that it was interesting because at the, the first Kadoshka, people were like, oh, you should go to the second Kadoshka. And, and I was kind of like, well, if I have the time and I have the money. And I had changed and was working for a different company. And uh, I would fly out and be flown into a certain paper mill and work 24 hours a day for a week and would accumulate all this. They called it flex time, time off because they, they wouldn't uh, pay us overtime and we were salary. 
so it turned out that I had the time and I had the money for the, the Q2. And then in the end of June was Sundance. And I kind of, everybody's like at the Kodoshko, everybody's like, oh, you should come to Sundance. And I was like, hey, yeah, easy, you know, what's going on? <laughs> you know, We'll see if I have the time and I have the money. And then it just always seemed to be that way. And so it- The uh, real Sundance you're talking about or the- or Yeah, the, yeah. In, in and uh, that's, I think really when we um, connected the most, because we had a, you know, a whole week of being around each other and uh, enjoying each other's company. And that's really when I decided I was going to move to Phoenix at that point, that I really was going to let go of my, um, my own dream of chemical engineering and the corporate world. I didn't know what I was going to do. My specialty was water chemistry and, uh, there's no water processes here in the desert. Uh, and then I would just, I would find another job. I'd find a way. So, uh, we were talking on the phone. I was still living in Atlanta and I uh, flew out here in September to, to interview with companies and try to find a job. And then I moved out in October uh, and was still uh, trying to find something in the traditional way of living life. So C Christine was full-time working as Swifter's assistant and was kind of uh, full-time into a medicine life, uh, a spiritual devoted life where I was had one foot in, in and one foot out. I was still trying to, you know, build some kind of a career and uh, at the same time uh, go through my own spiritual practices and uh, ceremonial experiences and growth. Uh, and that was in uh, 96 through 97. And, uh, and the company I ended up coming and working out for uh, was to be a corporate recruiter in the plastics industry. And after like nine months of that, I realized I didn't want to do that. So then I waited tables because I'd waited tables all through college is how I paid for most of my college. And I made more money waiting tables than I had, had made so far. So I was like, all right, great. But it had me working evenings and weekends. And then that was when most of teachings and ceremonial events was weekends and evenings. Uh, so after doing that, uh, trying to juggle making money as a waiter and uh, having access to events that were for training in our tradition, I decided to walk away from that. And then I just found uh, another job that allowed me flexibility in the weekends and times. And we'd started dating by then. Um, you started a computer. Yeah, it was after that I started my own computer repair mm. business. Oh. Uh, and because I had, you know, built my own computer in uh, 94 and before the internet was around and my dad had been into computers a um, uh, long time ago, like when the first thing you could dial up with the suction cups that had the... <laughs> <laughs> Remember them well. Yeah, it was in the... <laughs> Like 82, I think he had a computer. I had a Commodore 64 in like 83 or 84 or something. I got my K-Pro in 83. Yeah. <laughs> 150 baud modem. I hate oh, that modem. was high tech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, then because of that, uh, there, there was a moment where um, uh, Christine had uh, said to me that there was going to be an opening for training inside of the Shamanathi Armoring. Mm. And would I, was I interested? She's like, would you be interested? <laughs> and I was like, you know, anything you want to do, honey, I'll do. <laughs> and because I didn't really, uh, I mean, I de-armored myself, was deeply impacted by it. I, uh, you know, ha hadn't been physical since I graduated college and, it, you know, it declined in my physicality. And then Within days of completing the armoring, um, uh, Swiftier and the, the group of martial arts students that I was part of, we had a physical uh, fitness test where you run and push ups and sit ups and chin ups and all, all of this stuff. And I actually performed better in that than I had ever done in my life. And I'm like, how can how can this be? I'd you know started smoking cigarettes and hadn't done anything physical in four years. I was, you know, drove uh, 95,000 miles in a car for 18 months in Florida. So the, 
the sides of my knees would hurt when I would run. And yet all of a sudden here was this incredible physical performance. And the only thing I could tie it to was the de armoring, which I had just finished three days beforehand. And so then I became fascinated from a scientist's point of view. I was like, how is this possible? This doesn't match. I shouldn't have this level of performance out of nowhere, like run three miles faster than I've ever run them before when I was um, playing rugby and running all the time here. I'm couch potato for four years smoking cigarettes and now I suddenly run faster than I've ever run in my life, you know? Uh, so I, I then started training inside of the Shaman at the Armoring and very much enjoyed it, found it very challenging to, to hold a, a neutral space for someone else because then I had to start working on my own triggers and find my own uh, resolution to my issues so that they wouldn't you know, get in the way in order to hold space and support someone else. Mm. Um, and I think that was... That was around 2000, 99, 2000, something like that. Um, always, you know, kind of used 9-11 because we did our workshop in October that was after 9-11. So that was kind of the definitive mm -hmm. experience. And that was, a. Uh, so I know it was before then that I had started training. Uh, and then, uh, Christine, you'd started going to Canada to hold workshops on your own. And I think it was like 2003, I just found some old computer files that were flyers that we did. It's 2003, I think, we went to um, LA. There was a group of students that were out there that couldn't take time off to come to the armor in Swifter's office and said that, hey, we want to the armor. It was like seven or eight of them, I think. And so that was... Christine's first four away on her own. And she says, you want to come do it? And I'm like, hell yeah. I, I was had my own computer repair business at the time. Uh, and we w went out, is it three week, three long weekends or four long weekends. We drove to LA and um, kind of, that was our first time working together on our own, just the two of us. And we had, uh, supported Swift Deer with a couple of workshops in Phoenix, but it's very different to be out there on your own. Yeah. And I had been in uh, Canada. Uh, yeah, with Mary. With Mary and, and yeah. on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a couple of years, actually, yeah. before that. Yeah, so we started with, uh, you know, nine or seven or eight or nine people so. or something. And it was like, no, it's nine. You're right. It's a nine. lot of people. We, we were like, oh, yeah. okay. So, you know, how are we going to do this <laughs> and so on? And then after some years, there was, we went to 12 people maximum mm -hmm. and worked with 12 people. Mm -hmm. And then again, we went to 15 people. And, and so it's, it's just kept on growing, but I, it was a beautiful uh, growth because it was also a growth for us being able to care for the amount of people we were able to care for and then we were able to care for more people and then we were able to care for more people so we kind of grew in alignment with the 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 program if you will mm -hmm. yeah yeah then we had that one year where there was like was it 30 32 or 34 and we would do a, a group uh in the early you know, morning early afternoon quickly make an hour for dinner and then do another group in the evening. And we realized that that, that was uh, too much. <laughs> yeah, it was too many. We weren't able to uh, stay as, as connected and as deep to each person and their, their process, the individual experience they were going through that we, that we would like to have. So we realized, okay, that's, that's too many because we would, each evening we, we do a review of what each person experienced. And it was like, Ah, I didn't. I don't remember the the super details, or I would remember some, and Christine would remember some. Mm. So we realized that that we found our upper limit, if you will. Uh, let's fill the the viewers into a little more on uh, uh, the deer tribe and swift deer, and just give a whatever uh, outline you can of of uh, the whole spiritual tradition and. Um, sure. So it's uh, a shamanic tradition. 
Uh, Swifter is a partial Cherokee, and he learned from uh, many different sources, from his own experiences, from experiences of teachers, from his own learnings from himself. And when was it? In the late 70s is when he started, um, that he started to teach his martial arts students uh, this uh, Native American shamanic uh, teachings. And they found it interesting and it kind of grew and he traveled through Europe for a while teaching people. And, and then fr from that came this organization known as the Deer Tribe. That's kind of the short name for it. Uh, kind of a, a takeoff on his name, Swift Deer, if you will. And uh, the full name is the Deer Tribe Métis Medicine Society. Métis being mixed blood people um, that have blood from many different traditions, many different countries, if you will. And so that uh, is a, um, a ceremonial, spiritual practice uh, uh, tradition where there's teachings, there's assignments, there's training, there's uh, recipes to um, go out in nature and to find creation as our teacher and that um, that the acknowledging that nature and the and great spirit is the the teacher if you will and that everyone else is kind of guides to guide us into a deeper connection with creation mm -hmm. more so than um that you know other spiritual traditions have a central figure as a as a guru as a physical teacher that then there's a devotion to them um, our lineage is a little different in that it's a devotion more to the self and to uh, uh, like for uh, my spiritual devotion to myself and that my path that I walk uh, lines up with this spiritual path. And therefore there's, while that is still my path with heart aligns up with the, the twisted hair or sweet medicine Sundance path is what it's called. Then I'm now walking that path. And there's a, a guide that's, someone who is studied a little longer can help me um you know and interpret the ceremonies what does it what does this mean and what is this what is, what is this wheel what is this teaching and they can share their experiences and their journey but ultimately it's us to find our connection to creation and not needing an interpreter and not be um reliant on an individual as a central s source or a voice. So it's a, it's a, the, the spiritual journey is in some ways back to oneself mm -hmm. as the source. So Christ is within, or we are a cell within great spirit's body. Uh, we are a being that is interconnected to all other aspects of the universe. Therefore, we can feel and access uh, its knowledge, if you will. Mm. So, uh, you know, one of the key uh, slogans or principles is don't believe anything we say. So if you're not going to believe anything, then you have to actually test it out take it for a drive, see if it grows corn. Does this technique support you to be more emotionally balanced? Does this teaching, if you implement it in your life, does it open you to more options? Does it help uh, silence the inner critic? Or does it actually do what it says it will do? And so each student is charged with that responsibility within themselves. And so the tradition is very much uh, 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 in service for that to happen for each and every individual. Mm. And so it becomes a, a, a tradition that is uh, very much upholding self-initiative and, uh, and like John said, uh, people who are more experienced than you, they are not your teacher because life is your teacher. 
the universe is your teacher, but they become a guide because they have walked down the path before and they can say, oh, over to the right there is a really good uh, fresh water. And so it's great to, to get some water there for the continued hike. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so in that way, it stays, uh, even though it's obviously has hierarchy in different levels of leadership and so on, uh, everyone within the tradition is an apprentice that everyone has equal responsibility as to how to implement the teachings and see if they grow corn or not. So that is something we both are very attracted to. Yeah. Uh, very strong, what we call wellness principles of, you know, not having the doctor fix you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very yeah, much, the, very, very much the same as that. Like how do, how do we take responsibility? for our own healing yeah. and, and acknowledgement that we have the intelligence within ourselves, We do have the resources within ourselves to, to heal ourselves. Heal ourself. yeah. We may need some coaching or some guidance or some, you know, uh, how do we access those resources or how do we apply those resources? But you know, it's one of the kind of foundations is that we're not seeing any human as lacking, mm -hmm. like a, of substance, if you will, maybe lacking of life experience, wisdom, knowledge, um, but not, not lacking something they have to get from the outside. It's more what, what knowledge, what connection to creation will help them awaken to the knowledge they have inside so that they then can uh, access their resources and apply that for their healing or their um uh, or there's their the health and happiness mm. versus there being you know i as a teacher i have something you don't have and so you need to come come to me and i will be the source and the authority over you and i get to tell you whether you're doing it right or not right like that's uh I don't think either one of us would be interested in anything like that. We're too willful. <laughs> and I should have qualified that of what passes for wellness nowadays is, is a watered down version of what Halbert Dunn, who inspired me in the 70s, was. It's, mm. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's it, the number one hit for wellness was dog food for quite a while. It's dropped mm. to number five now, but. Uh, uh, and the Dan Rather piece where he interviewed us in 1979, he opened it saying, wellness. Now there's a word you don't hear every day. And we had to spell it on the phone to people, but then it got glommed onto and everybody and their sister uses it uh, now, but yeah, it's a not, catchphrase. not in, a, in the sense that you just described. I think the positive psychology movement probably better reflects what it had been than anything that passes for wellness. I'm curious, the, the uh, creature there on your right, uh, uh, Christine, is, is he, a, he or she? A, this a, is a, a Toltec guardian. Uh -huh. So it's a guardian uh, energy uh, that is um, a part of the temple sites uh, down in uh, Mexico. Uh, but I Mexico. I don't remember the name of it right now. South and Central America. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it holds a, it holds a nice energy uh, of uh, of the origin of our tradition, if you will. Uh huh. I thought. Yeah. I think I, I think it's Mayan uh, in in origin of the different temples site down in uh, mm -hmm. in Mexico, um, but it is you know represents someone that carries knowledge, someone that uh, is also a warrior willing to take a stand to support the justice, right? Um, and also someone that will uh, feed the people and their knowledge and healing feeds the people. Well, that so that's uh, why brings me to the, the, the current situation right now with a lockdown and a uh, what to me is a, a major overreach of civil liberties and uh, misrepresentation, having done a master's in public health and knowing a lot about public health, what they're telling us on the news ain't what I think's going on. <laughs> I'm curious what your perspective is and how things are in Arizona. 
Well, yeah, it's a big question. You know, I think uh, uh, a loaded one too. I can I can guarantee that if it wasn't an election year, I'm sure it would be being covered differently in the news. Yeah. Um, un unfortunately, I think the news is no longer the ideal of the, the media being the neutral journalist that would seek out, find the truth and report the truth wherever it led them, yeah. however it appeared without personal agenda or bias. I think those days are gone. Um, unfortunately, no matter what side of the spectrum a person finds themselves, that all sides seem to be desirous to push a personal agenda of how they know it should be and how we should live and how we should behave. Um, so I think the this the stress of the pandemic is um, accentuating that um, divergent from the the um, ideals of the media. So therefore, when we look online, you, we don't know what to believe. I, I don't. I mean, I'm, I read every day for an hour in the news and read through different stuff, and I tend to gravitate more towards the the studies and the numbers, because that's kind of my training background of biochemistry and chemistry. Um, but yeah, it definitely is, uh, I think it's a, uh, a beautiful opportunity for us so that are we each gonna take responsibility for ourselves, And we're getting a reflection of how interconnected we are. Mm -hmm. This idea that, that, that what I do doesn't impact those around me. So I get to do whatever I want to do and I should have the freedom to do whatever I want to do, you know, uh, has always positively or negatively impacted those around us. But now here we're having a, a reflection back of, uh, I should have awareness for how I'm choosing to, to be and behave. Um, whether it's having awareness of, am I sick or not? Maybe I shouldn't go to the store or, um, or if I feel fine, then, then you know, it leads us to at least start to contemplate our impact on the other because we are a, a family. We're not a bunch of individuals in isolation on islands. And uh, I think that's something of the collective mind, if you will, is trying to make up its mind. How do we do this? How do we mm -hmm. truly empower each other without having a coercion on an individual's uh, ability to be who they are, but then also how do we lift up that individual to recognize their their weight of responsibility of being a, uh, an active contributing member of the society? Because you know the society, uh, like you were saying, is like the overreach onto the individual, and then in some ways we have no more excuses to be dumb anymore and do dumb stuff. <laughs> you know, and I, that's. For us as a, you know, there's been many different traditions speak about a time of awakening or even in the, um, the astrological times, you know, the age of Aquarius and this, the, the, you know, the, the, every spiritual tradition has some sort of speaking about a time of awakening. And I, I think this is an opportunity for us to how we meet this. Do we, you know, raise our game, if you will, on, on all fronts? Do we get over our petty d disagreements and find solution? Do we, do we honor the differences and bring them together in a way that creates something better than the sum of the parts? And, you know, synergistic is a, a buzzword these days, but do we do that? Or are we more entrenched in our knowing and being right to now we're going to war with each other? And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, uh, a scary and fascinating time right now, I think, because it's very clear that that collectively we're making a decision of how we're going to be. What are we going to carry forward to the next generation? What kind of world are we going to leave? There's a, a, a foundation principle in our tradition is that we leave a space better than we find it. So we go out into nature and we do ceremony, then on one level, we don't leave wrappers and we don't leave messes. We actually leave it better than we found it. But that, that spiritual principle translates also into every interaction. Do we leave an interaction with another human better than we found it? And, you know, is that how we're going to live as humans on the earth? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to, are we going to leave it worse than we found it? And that's, uh, I think a, a good question for everyone to live by. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a, 
Yeah, it's a dicey time these days, you know. Sure is, yeah. And it's interesting because the the contamination, if you will, or the the energetic of the pandemic where it is clear that something contaminating is spreading very easily. Uh, it is uh, in many ways a symbol for, for everything. How do we, like if you look at the political debate, for example, uh, is that, a, is that a, a debate amongst two men who actually respect each other? It's, it's embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> You know, it's a very contaminating. It's loaded with uh, emotional drama mm -hmm. uh, and the same with the news. So it's very interesting to look at the pandemic and then look at how we are behaving in our society. How, how are we with our friends? Do we talk behind each other's back and spread rumors? Or, you know, how do we, how, how do we live as human beings? Mm. Well, uh, as a wrap up, do you have any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to leave for future generations that uh, we hope will watch this someday? Well, follow your heart. I think that's one thing is that, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, to, to seek what is and to question what is my heart to follow? What is this calling inside I have? Uh, I think every, every one of us is unique and we have a natural gift that we've come here to give, to be, to discover, to share, and uh, to value our uniqueness and to look within for what do we have instead of trying to copy some ideal outside to wear the right clothes or say the right things or, uh, or, you know, uh, dare to be bold and say something that may get you Twitter canceled. But is it coming from uh, the source inside? Is it the truth? Or is it, mm -hmm. you know, just um, you know, vomiting emotionality through the vehicle of Twitter, for example, but to like uh, seek inside and find what is this uh, desire we have? What is our true? What is our calling? And, and follow that and stay true to that. I feel that's kind of what we both have done. Um, and whenever I read stories of people that have gone beyond and made a difference in the world, that's what they've done. They followed their heart's desire, they call it, or the calling or some, some need or drive inside. And that takes them on a different path, which leads them to find something new and often something better that we all as humanity gain from every one of those people, men and women that, walked the the different path and discovered something and brought it back so we've all gained by it whether it's this you know incredible technology that allows us to meet this way or spiritual insights that are thousands of years old that we have these because someone followed that desire inside that says hey i want to i think i have something here i want to go explore it i want to see where this leads and where this takes me mm -hmm. uh, and and staying true to that versus what we're supposed to be. I mean, we can all learn from each other, but if I was who I was supposed to be, I'd still be a chemical engineer <laughs> and, and, and unhappy. You know, I would, I would have a level of surface happiness because I would have a certain level of stimulus that would create enough distraction, but um, I never really second guess my desire to, to take a different turn in my life because when I tune inside, then I'm honoring, uh, you know, my heart's desire. And I think that's a foundation for, for wellness and happiness. You're going to say something. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, there's so many things one could say as a parting thought, but since we are on the topic of, uh, what we have been on, I think that, uh, taking responsibility for the ripple effect that we are creating, taking responsibility for being an agent of true co-empowerment uh, and uh, being willing to forego uh, 
untruths that kind of felt like truths in the past, but now is being discovered as being flawed, being actually humble enough and willing to go, yeah, you know, I really thought that was true, but now I have discovered that this and this and this is actually uh, works much, much better. So it's like the combination of a willingness to learn and grow no matter what, let go of what doesn't work, not be embarrassed about the journey of learning that requires, if we really are on the journey of learning, it's gonna require that we make mistakes. We're gonna to have to get outside of our comfort zone into the unknown and make a bunch of mistakes if we really, really want to learn. And so to, to go for as much learning and growing and healing in this lifetime as possible. And that requires having a, a plate for humble pie by, your, by every meal of the day, because it's humbling to in one hand, stand for what it is that I know is true. And then on the other hand, as that truth evolves, be willing to acknowledge, yeah, that one needs to go through a rebirth because this is now what I realize. So it's this combination of, uh, of willingness to stand for what you know is true and willingness to let go of it and acknowledge when it is outdated and keep moving forward. Wonderful way to wrap up. Thank you. Well, thank you both for sharing your lives and we hope uh, we'll uh, benefit many people that come after us and uh, my pleasure, so. Yeah, I wanna say thank you for, yeah. for your, for your uh, dream of making this project happen for the wisdom in your elder nature to actually gather all of the different people that you're going to be gathering in this project together because it does it's going to illuminate um something of beauty amongst us as human beings so i thank you for your your vision well thank you i uh no idea where it's going it's just <laughs> un unfolding well, that's how you know you're on the right track you know if we know where it's leading then we're here but if we know we don't know where it's leading then we're here yeah and i i'll look at I've a list of almost 500 names and i think well who, who do i want to talk to next week i just <laughs> try how many to... have you been talking to so far i got a little over 100 now oh good for wow. you wow <clears throat> yeah I uh, haven't added them up recently, but uh, yeah, I'm doing two or three a week and uh, started to move into the infant wellness arena now. So it's uh, another whole ball game. Yeah, I'm going to end the recording. Um,